This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. We are continuing our study of the examples of conversion in the book of Acts of the Apostles given unto us by the Holy Spirit through Luke, the inspired writer. We come now to the eighth chapter of the book of Acts to study the conversion of the people in Samaria, the Samaritans. Many things happened after the church of our Lord began on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, as we noticed in our previous study. As the apostles continued to work and to preach and to teach, people continued to obey the Lord. But there was opposition. There were some who did not like the preaching of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, meaning that in the by and by all would be raised from the dead. The devil always is opposed to the growth of the Lord's church and to the preaching of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we have an account of some persecutions. But as we come to the closing part of chapter 7, we read of the stoning of Stephen and that after that, the members of the church were scattered abroad out of Jerusalem in various directions, but they went everywhere preaching the word as we read in Acts 8 and verse 4. Chapter 7 records the long speech that Stephen made. Now Stephen was one of the seven men selected in the Jerusalem congregation to wait on the tables and the daily ministration of the food. But the apostles laid hands upon these individuals and they were able to do things in a miraculous way by the power of the Holy Spirit to help and to assist in the Lord's work. And Stephen was a great preacher and speaker and thus taught but there was opposition to Stephen, but he had a beautiful, noble life, and as he was being stoned to death, he prayed in behalf of his enemies that the sin might not be laid to their charge. Standing by was a young man who had been taught in the Jewish faith and very zealous for the Old Testament law by the name of Saul. He was from the city of Tarsus in Cilicia. He was standing by, guarding the garments of those that cast the stones at Stephen. And he heard this man as he prayed. As Stephen looked up to the heavens, he said, the, I see the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell asleep. He died. But after that, Saul continued his persecution against the church of our Lord persecuting them, even men and women, under death, making habit of the church. Now, Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, does not go into detail and tell us where all the apostles and, I mean, the members of the church went and of their work, the apostles remaining in Jerusalem. But it does pick up one, namely Philip. And so we read beginning at verse 5 of chapter 8, that Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Samaria was north of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was on an elevation, and so truly he went down to Samaria. And there he preached Christ unto them. That is, he told them concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and of salvation in Christ Jesus, and how they could be saved from their sins. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Miracles were used to confirm the word, to prove that this was a divinely given message. Individuals without the power of the Holy Spirit could not perform miracles. No one can perform miracles today. But we read that unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, 
and there was great joy in that city. They heard the message concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that was wonderful. And then miracles were performed. The sick were cured. People were healed. Demon-possessed individuals were freed of that. And so there was great joy in that city. There was a certain man called Simon, we read in verse 9, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched a fool deceived the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. They were deceived, but he practiced sorcery and deceit, a sleight of hand man in various ways, to whom all the people gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, made a lot of money also in deceiving the people. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when Philip got there and performed real, genuine miracles, the people could see the difference. And many believed. The next verse says, And when they believed, but when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So they could see the difference. They heard the gospel. They believed this message. And they were baptized in the name by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, men and women. So they could rejoice. They had learned that there was deception being practiced on them. They had been giving up their money for a long time to keep up this sorcery or this man who practiced sorcery. But now they've learned about the soul salvation, remission of sins, and at the same time that this individual has used tricks upon them to obtain money. But what about Simon? And this is so unusual. In verse 13, Simon himself believed also. Now, sometimes people have said, well, Simon wasn't sincere in this. Well, it doesn't say that Simon himself believed. It says Simon himself believed also. Were all the people sincere? Well, also Simon. He also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. We do not know how many were baptized in Samaria, Luke centers upon this individual by the name of Simon who had practiced sorcery. Many believed and were baptized in Samaria from verse 12, both men and women. But even Simon, he knew the difference. He could see the difference. He knew what he had been doing. He realized that what Philip was doing was genuine. And so he too believed and was baptized. And he continued with Philip, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now then, beginning at verse 14, we have something else that we need to study. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God and that people had been baptized in obedience to the Lord's will, of course, they sent unto them Peter and John these two apostles. Now notice, the apostles asked Peter and John to go down to Samaria. Now why did they ask for Peter and John to go down to Samaria? Well, let us read on. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And then in parenthesis, far as yet he, the Holy Spirit, was fallen upon none of them only, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right 
in the sight of God. Let's stop reading there and notice a few things. In this early day of the church of our Lord, of Christians being made, of people being converted to the Lord, now in other places round about Jerusalem, the Lord's plan as given beginning at Jerusalem and then throughout Judea and then the Samaria and Galilee and finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. That which the devil had planned to use to destroy the church was the means used in the providence of God for the church really to grow and to spread. And because these disciples being scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so the Lord used this as the means for them to go out and beyond and to preach the word of the Lord. Many went. Here's an example of one going, namely Philip. And he goes to Samaria, north of Jerusalem. The Samaritans were those of a mixed race, not pure Jewish people. But anyway, they were entitled to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because it was worldwide to all people. And so they heard and believed and obeyed. And even Simon, who had practiced sorcery, and he continued uh, with Philip for some time, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. Now, Peter and John came down. We know why they came down, because we know what they did when they came down. They laid their hands on certain ones, and they received the miraculous gifts of powers of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we read that in this early day, there were those who had certain miraculous powers bestowed upon them by the apostles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have the apostle Paul talking about the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, being able to speak in tongues or to work miracles or to teach as an inspired prophet or the interpretation of tongues, so forth. And then in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we read that there is something better that will outlast these miraculous gifts, namely charity or love, because these gifts will cease. And then in chapter 14, we read about how the gifts were to be used while they did last, and especially in the public services, speaking in tongues or different languages and the interpretation of tongues and all things were to be done decently and in order. No one but an apostle ever bestowed any of these miraculous gifts. Now there's a difference in these miraculous gifts and the power that came to the apostles by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We read in John 3, 34 that Jesus possessed the Spirit without measure. And that implies that others might have the Spirit by measure. That is the power of the Spirit. Because Jesus said, you shall be endued with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit is a divine person of the Godhead. We read of God the Father, God the Son, or the Word that became flesh and lived among us, as John would write in chapter 1 of the book of John. And then God the Holy Spirit. Because back in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, Concerning the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, the Holy Spirit is spoken of as God. Because in verse 3, and Peter asked concerning Ananias, Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And then he says, You haven't lied unto men, but unto God. The Holy Ghost, God. When Jesus gave the command to baptize, he said, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a divine person of the Godhead. In the Godhead, the one Godhead, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had a part in man's salvation in that he guided and directed certain individuals to preach the Word and to record the Word. He had a part in enabling certain ones to perform miracles to confirm the Word and to speak in other languages or dialects to teach the Word of the Lord. 
and to guide certain individuals in writing all the truths concerning Christianity and the Lord's church as we have it here in the New Testament. Just like he guided certain prophets in the Old Testament period, David wrote, guided by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, we read concerning a prophecy of David, and Peter says the Holy Spirit said this by David and his scripture. And so the Holy Spirit had a part in helping the congregations to grow spiritually and to become established. The apostles could not remain at one place all the time, and so different individuals received miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts 6, after Philip and Stephen and others were selected as men to help wait on the tables, we read in verse 6, and that they were brought before the apostles and they laid their hands on them. The apostles laid hands upon them and here you have the first example, the apostles laying hands and imparting these miraculous gifts or powers of the Spirit. In Romans 1, 16, Paul mentioned the fact that he longed to come to Rome that I may impart unto thee some spiritual gift. We notice also in the writing of Paul to Timothy and that Timothy had a gift because Paul said, Neglect not the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. That's 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. So the apostles bestowed these miraculous gifts. No one but an apostle bestowed any of these gifts. Another thing we notice in the study about these gifts that the individual receiving a gift from an apostle never did pass it on down to someone else. So when the last apostle died, there wasn't anyone to bestow these gifts. And when the last man died who had received a gift from an apostle, then these miraculous gifts ceased. They had to cease. But by that time, of course, all the truth had been given and recorded and confirmed and there wasn't any need of these miraculous gifts because then we have all the truth of the Lord given and recorded for us. And it was the man's duty to preach the word of the Lord, God's power and the salvation. That's in the gospel of Jesus Christ as we read in Romans 1 and verse 16. So we have an example here in Acts 8 of these apostles bestowing these miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, why didn't Philip do this? Philip had the gift of working miracles because we read in verse 6 that the people saw the miracles which he did. And we read in verse 13 and that Simon, after his conversion to Christ, continued with Philip, beholding the miracles and signs uh, which were done by him. Evidently, he could not. And so it was necessary for two apostles to come down from Jerusalem that these individuals might have these miraculous gifts as new Christians to help carry on the Lord's work as a group of converted people here in Samaria. Now they had been baptized in the name of the Lord, verse 16, to receive the blessings in Christ as children of God, but they did not have any of these miraculous gifts. And no one today has any of these miraculous gifts because there is no apostle living to bestow any of these miraculous gifts. And certainly there is no one living as old enough to say, well, I received a gift from Peter or John or Paul or some other apostle. So they've ceased, they've long ceased, but they were given for a purpose and for a period of time. Going back to 1 Corinthians again, in chapter 13, after the Apostle Paul talked about these gifts and saying that charity or love will never fail, he said in verse 8, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away using these three as an example, they're going to cease, vanish away. Now we know in part, prophesying part, part by part, the truth is given. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
part by part the teaching was done and the truth was being revealed. But when all of it has been revealed and given and recorded, then we'll not need any of these miraculous gifts. That, when that which is come, not He comes, mainly Christ, at the end of time. No, not that at all. That perfect thing, that completeness of the word of the Lord, of the truth of the Lord. And then he gave an example. When I was a child, I spake as a child, thought as a child, understood as a child. I had childish ways about me. After I became a man, I put away those things. I like to use this illustration. It teaches the same thing. I go through a city and I see various kinds of machinery uh, being used round about a building that's under construction. I might go back through the city a few months later and all of that uh, machinery and the scaffolding has been removed and the building looks like it's completed, it's finished. Well, it has been finished. And so there's no need of all that scaffolding now because that was used while the building was under construction. And so when it's finished, the equipment is removed. And so it was necessary in that early day of the church that the Holy Spirit enable certain individuals to do certain things. This is a lesser benefit or power, a measure of the influence of the Holy Spirit than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The apostles received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now we have these miraculous gifts being bestowed by an apostle. But they were to cease. All right. And they did cease. And so in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Love and faith and hope will continue, and the greatest is love. Then he talks about how to use these gifts while they did last. But there's another verse also that says exactly the same truth and was written by the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in verse 7, he speaks of the ascended Christ and the gifts being given, the measure of the gift of Christ. And he gave gifts unto men, the last expression of chapter, uh, verse 8 of this chapter. And then in verse 11, omitting the two verses in parentheses, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers or qualified elders for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the completeness, the unity of the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jude 3, Jude talks about contending earnestly for the faith once for all, once for all time, given unto the saints, the faith. So these miraculous gifts, apostles and others, necessary till, until, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and the perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, until, a certain thing is to be until, and when that till was reached, then they ceased. So when the last apostle died and the last man died that had received the gift from the Apostle by the laying on the apostle's hand, these miraculous gifts automatically cease because they were no longer needed, no longer necessary. One today does not have any of the miraculous gifts. One today cannot work a miracle by the power of the Lord. No one today can speak in the language he has not studied and learned. If we want to know God's will, we're to read in the study of the Word of God or hear it proclaimed by somebody else as he reads and studies the Bible and preaches the word of the Lord. So it's necessary that we learn this lesson from the 8th chapter of the book of Acts of the Apostles concerning the conversion of the Samaritans. But now let's notice something else about Simon. Simon sinned in that he said, Oh, I want that power, Peter, John, so I can lay my hands on people and give them the power of the Holy Spirit. 
This is a way I have of making money. My, I don't have this power. I'd like to have it. And Peter rebuked him and said, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Verse 20. And then verse 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now many have said he was not truly converted. Well, I again go back to the verse 13. He himself believed also. Yes, he was converted, but he sinned afterwards. Well, now what should he do? Should he be baptized again? Baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. We learn that of those who were converted on the day of Pentecost. Here we have the same apostle, Peter. What does Peter tell him to do? Why, well, he tells him to repent and be baptized. Is that right? Well, look at verse 22. Peter says, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, not all of your sins, but this, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And here we have the law of forgiveness, a restoration to the child of God. He's been baptized. He's in the body of Christ. He has received the forgiveness of his past sins. But now as a child of God, what should he do? Repent and pray God for the forgiveness of his sins because your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, Peter did not say you are yet in your sins and you have never been forgiven of your sins. Well, if that be true, then he need to tell him to repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. But that's not the way it reads. So that's not what he's teaching. No, he believed just like the others believed and was baptized just like all the others were baptized, but he sinned later. And here is what the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter tells this child of God in error what to do, namely repent of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Because, he said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He didn't say, I perceive that you never have been converted, that you're still in the bond of iniquity. No, he didn't say that. At this time you are. Yes, a child of God can sin. He can so sin and die in that condition and be eternally lost. The Bible teaches that. He can be lost as a child of God in error, in sin, after receiving the forgiveness of his past sins. Now let's go to John, the beloved apostle John, who was along with Peter upon this occasion in Samaria, but writing many years later to Christians. He said, verse 7 of 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin, continues to cleanse us from all sin. We walk in the light. But now if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, from all unrighteousness. Peter said, Repent of this thy wickedness and pray God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then we go to the language of John and read that. And we know that a member of the church, a child of God, is to repent, confess his sins, pray God, and ask the Lord forgiveness, and if we were sincere in doing that, then the Lord will forgive us of our sins. This is the teaching of the Word of God. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, James said, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we often speak of this as the second law of pardon. 
and that is pardon to the child of God, the member of the church who has obeyed the teaching of the Lord. Verse 24, back in Acts 8, says that Simon answered and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And that's all we know about Simon. Nothing else is said in the New Testament concerning him, and I don't know what happened. But if he sincerely, truly repented, and he was forgiven by the Lord, and live faithful to the end of life's journey, certainly heaven will be your home. And if those who were converted in the city of Samaria remain faithful in the service of the Lord, they too will be a part of that renewed number around the great white throne of God in the beautiful eternal city we call heaven. The chapter continues by telling us that in verse 25, that Peter and John, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans on their way back to Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit had a purpose in mind to record this for us. Here is preaching done by someone else other than by an apostle. Philip goes to the city of Samaria preaching to those other than the pure Jewish people. And also we have Christianity or the teaching of an inspired man coming in direct conflict with the great deceiver, sorcerer, and how he exposed him and how this man could come to deep, sincere repentance and to, with faith in the Lord, be baptized and receive the forgiveness of his sins. I believe there are many today who are being fooled and deceived in the religious world by those who claim to be some great power of God and work miracles and send out blessed claws, prayer claws, praying for you that you may be healed. Send the money, send the money. We've heard so much in the last few months in our American nation concerning those who have claimed to do this and that and the other and how they've been living very exorbitantly. High on the hog, to use that expression, because they have to see people. Friends, there is no one today who can work a real Bible miracle by the power of God. He doesn't have that power. There is no apostle living to do it. There is no man living who received a miraculous gift from an apostle. That had to do with the early days of Christianity to establish the church, to reveal and confirm and record the truth. And miracles have ceased. Don't be deceived by a so-called modern Simon who wants to enrich himself and claim to be some great power of the Lord. True gospel preachers are not necessarily interested in people's money. They're interested in people's souls. Certainly, we receive money from brethren for preaching and working in the Lord's service, but we're not preaching for money. That's not the motive of it. We we'll gladly use our lives in service to help people learn and obey the truth of the Lord because we love the souls of individuals. So, what did these Samaritans do? They heard the gospel preached by Philip concerning the Savior, God's wonderful love for man by the grace of the Lord. They sincerely and truly turned from that, were baptized in obedience to the Lord's will, were forgiven of their sins, and became children of God in the Lord's church. What about these miraculous gifts that some receive at the laying on of the hands of Paul and I rather mean Peter and John, two apostles? Yes, that was necessary in that early day. But not for Simon who wanted to use the power to have that. He wasn't an apostle. He couldn't do that. And he was rebuked. But we learn the need of his repentance and prayer unto God. 
As Paul by inspiration tells us, these miraculous gifts were to last until a certain time, the unity of the faith, until that time comes, and then these will pass away. May God help us to study His will and to teach the truth of the Lord, that people may not be deceived, but they may learn of the simplicity in Christ Jesus and come in sincere, obedient faith and be baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. And thus the Lord will save them and add them to the church and they'll be the children of God. Do not expect any kind of a direct, miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit on the heart for one's salvation. No, it's through the power of the gospel of Christ. The Holy Spirit operates through the Word. And when we hear the Word and believe it and obey it, we're saved. And we should rejoice in the salvation of our souls. May God help us to do His will. This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory.